Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, my name is Marta Mueller. I'm a manager of customer success here at WellSaid Labs, and I will be facilitating today's discussion. You might have been expecting my teammate, Caroline, uh, who was supposed to be facilitating, facilitating today's session. Uh, unfortunately, she's feeling uh, under the weather today, so sorry to disappoint there, but you have me. Uh, but luckily, uh, the real star of today's show is Ryan Johnson. Uh, so I wanted to kind of kick things off with introducing her. She started at WellSaid three years ago and is a senior voice data and machine learning engineer, mouthful. Uh, she works with our larger voice team to build the best and highest quality AI voice avatars. She's an expert in machine learning uh, as it applies to AI voice and crafting the most lifelike synthetic voices to ensure that they don't sound robotic and are as natural as possible. Ryan, if you want to kind of jump in here and say hello. Thank you, Marta. Can I steal that little pitch for my own elevator pitch when I meet people and try to tell them what I do? That was so yeah. well said and, and very kind words. I'm happy well to Well said. Nice. Was that intentional or not? <laughs> it was not intentional. That happens often, doesn't it? Yep, the puns come easy here, don't they? <laughs> um, well, great. So before I hand things over to you, a couple things to note, uh, starting with some housekeeping items. So we will be recording today's session, and we'll be sending that to all of you as a replay in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, you'll be able to send that uh, to your colleagues or other people, as well as reference it later on. Also, uh, you know, we would love the chat to be as engaged as possible. So we love everyone writing in, letting us know where you're from, everything like that. Uh, make sure if you are uh, participating in the chat that you are chatting to everyone uh, and not just the hosts and panels to make sure everyone's kind of included there. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout, please feel free to type those into the Q&A button, which is located on the bottom, uh, and we'll be able to get to those questions or as many questions as possible at the end. Sometimes the chat can get a little crazy and hectic, uh, so if you're able to put those in the Q&A button, that'll make sure that we don't miss those. Uh, awesome. So now we can kind of move into today's agenda. So what we'll be covering today are a few different things. First, starting if starting off with what's new in our latest model. Uh, well said, did release a new voice model a few weeks ago. So Ryan's going to be covering that. What's new, all of our exciting new um, functionality there. Then digging into the basics of AI voice models and how they are built, uh, something that Ryan is our absolute expert on. Next, going into how we approached and solved for text-to-speech challenges. If you are a WellSaid customer, uh, I'm sure you know you're already kind of thinking of a couple challenges that you might run into. So Ryan will be going over, you know, how we are listening to your feedback and how we're approaching and fixing some of those challenges that you might be running into. Next, going into our new respelling system. Uh, this is something that as uh, you know, somebody on the customer success team, I'm super excited about. Uh, so we'll be doing a deep dive into that, what respelling is and how it will make your life so much easier moving forward. And then, you know, kind of wrapping it up with what it all means and what comes next. And then we will save the last hopefully 10 or so minutes uh, for Q&A. Again, write your questions into that Q&A button and we'll try to uh, answer those at the end of today's session. That's all I have for now. So I will hand things over to Ryan to take things from here. Thank you, Marta. That was awesome. Um, I know it's going to get a little bit wordy and a little bit technical. So I'll try to just stay engaging. Like Marta said, throw any questions in the that Q&A. Um, be chatty in the chat and we'll, we'll get through all of it together. I hope it's fun and interesting. Um, let's start with what's new. We are so excited about the model we were able to uh, put out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and just I just talking about what's different about this model, what's so revolutionary about what we've done um, gets really exciting for me. So I'm, again, happy to be here and let's just dive in. Um, in this model, there's a lot going on um, outside of this, but for the focus today, I wanted to talk about four core goals that we set out. And like Marta said, it's based on a lot of feedback that we get from you all. So um, 
the first thing we wanted to do is improve intonation, especially in context, just understanding how we rise and fall um, as we're speaking and make sure that our avatars are able to do the same thing, especially in asking questions. We know that questions are challenging. Um, and even with that question mark in there, it doesn't always feel like the avatars are responsive to that. So that was a big goal for us. Um, the next is verbalizing numbers, symbols, abbreviations, et cetera. Um, just challenging, we call them non-standard words. Um, and how do we support you all so that you're not having to manually type out the words or the syllables um, in these long things? Uh, and that can be a straightforward read. So that was that's the next goal. Um, number three, improving pronunciation on the whole. Um, that's always a goal in TTS. There's always room for improvement. Um, there's roughly, just in English alone, there's roughly 500,000 words um, that exist. And so knowing how to say all of those or say new words um, that it hasn't seen before, um, that's been a big challenge. And then um, finally, um, when everything works as designed, that's awesome, but there's always times that you're going to need to share your preference with the avatar. Like Marta said, the goal, you know, is to interact just like you would with a voice actor. How do you give guidance? We wanted to create an approachable and intuitive system when those unique workarounds are still needed. So how do we take these goals, approach them, um, and try to try to be successful um, in, in the deep learning model? Let's just start with the basics of how a voice model um, is built. Um, we always start with the um, script and audio content from our voice actors. Um, and we turn that audio into something called a spectrogram. It's basically an expanded view of an audio uh, uh, waveform, um, but we're able to see all of the complexities of human speech and human hearing. It's trying to uh, mimic the way that we hear, the way you can listen to a podcast and immediately identify who's speaking even without seeing them, right? It's very unique um, to our own identity and there's a bunch of frequencies happening at the same time at various loudnesses. And so a spectrogram is a way that we can show the model all of that complexity at once. As you move from left to right across time, you're seeing those words take shape um, where all of those vibrations are happening and, and it and at um, what loudness is, um, et cetera. I'm gonna be using that term a lot, so it's helpful to know a spectrogram is audio, but it's a visual format. The next really important piece um, is the script content that goes alongside that audio. So the voice actors that we work with um, are very, very good at their jobs and um, we give them really kind of challenging, sometimes curated content to read um, and it's all well and good um, if, if we can make some connection between the script we've given them and the wonderful recordings they've given us. If the, the, that connection doesn't exist, then the recordings aren't really useful. Um, so we call that connection an alignment. So at the top of this image, we're seeing a spectrogram again, not quite as colorful as the previous window, but same concept. Um, that's the complexity of what that sound looks like as it moves through time. And we can look at the same timestamp um, within the text, and we know that start um, began at this point in time and ended being spoken at this point in time, then the word to began, then the word record began, etc. cetera. Um, and you can actually start to take like a visual shape of what that S sound looks like, what that T sound looks like, etc. cetera. Um, a fun little fact, there are humans out there that have been trained to read these images um, they can look at that green and blue blurry image and say, oh, that says start to record the voice, which is wild. But knowing that that's possible means the machine can do the same thing, right? So um, that's the big connection. Um, in the end, you all are providing text in the studio and you want some sort of audio to come out of it. Um, so how do we get that meaning? Um, it's, it's with these alignments. Here's a high level view then of what that training looks like. Again, there's our lovely Ava voice actor. Um, the script and the wave files come together. That wave um, is expanded into this spectrogram view and we're able to align it with the text that was spoken. And then we have two models that get trained. The first is what we call a spectrogram model. Um, that's where we're gonna focus today because um, the whole goal of the spectrogram model is how are words pronounced? How is prosody captured? How is this person reading this text and what does it visually look like, et cetera? 
the model itself will get a new piece of text, create a spectrogram image as a prediction and say, did I do a good job? Um, compare that spectrogram against a true spectrogram for that text and find those holes in those gaps, um, adjust its rules, and then make another prediction on new text next time, learn again. And this is why training takes a long time. Um, this is very high level rudimentary uh, explanation for deep learning. But if we can get the machine to make millions of those predictions, it's going to get better and smarter over time. And all of those complexities within the spectrogram, any gaps that were there in the beginning or any blurriness um, starts to smooth out and we actually get correct pronunciation, correct intonation, um, et cetera. That's the goal. Uh, the next little uh, model that's trained there we call the signal model because you all do not want to give us text and get back a rainbow image. Um, you would like an audio clip that you can use in the content that you're creating. So the signal model takes everything else and turns it back into a lovely wave or MP3 for you all. Um, very high level, very tech. Let's move on to the fun stuff that's actually functional for us. Um, here's that first goal, improving intonation. And Marta, I would love to hear from you and just the customer perspective, what has it been like working with our models so far when um, they speak maybe in a flat tone or you need to add emphasis? What is that whole experience like? Yeah, the uh, intonation is a fun one for sure, because I will say you've done an awesome job of, you know, from the customer's perspective, when you click create on generating your audio, it does make predictions to read that sentence as natural as possible with that natural intonation, but you will need to kind of give some specific direction sometimes if it is kind of a little flat or not exactly how you would like it to be pronounced. Uh, so this is where punctuation can kind of be a customer's best friend. So going in and throwing commas, uh, ellipses, dashes, periods in places that aren't necessarily grammatically correct, uh, but it will kind of change the entire dynamic of that sentence with just an additional, you know, punctuation. Also, um, adding emphasis, uh, we always recommend putting quotation marks around a specific word or phrase, and that will put emphasis and give that extra punch to that word or phrase. And so that really will help with that intonation as well. Another thing to note too, I have seen a dramatic improvement with intonation and kind of the naturalness of intonation with our new conversational styles. Uh, so if you are a well-said customer, you know we have uh, narration, promo, and now conversational. Conversational, uh, I describe it as how you would just be speaking most naturally with a friend or colleague. So it does kind of have more of a, like you always say, Ryan, not to steal yeah. your lingo, but the sing-songy, you know, <laughs> way of speaking. Yeah, no, that's great. That's exactly right. Um, we're noticing that too. So as we've added data like that to the model, um, is it able to learn a few more of those sing-songy cues, that prosody, those intonation changes throughout the sentence and where they fit in most naturally? Um, I think the big challenge, like I mentioned earlier, is still around questions because yes, I think we've been able now in this model to improve generally just how dynamic that and engaging that voice sounds. Um, but questions are really tricky and uh, we're about to dive into it, but I know some feedback we get and same internally, we debate this a lot. Um, you want, you see a question mark and your first response is, well, it should just go up at the end. Why is this person speaking this like a sentence? Um, so let's talk really quickly just about English in general and why questions are so hard. Um, English is not a tonal language. We don't think of it that way. And yet intonation is a really big component to English. Um, just changing pitch um, can affect meaning and intent behind our words. And so um, this gives a lot of ambiguity when you're training a model. Again, thinking about those spectrogram shapes. If it's trying to learn a pattern, um, but every time it sees the same string of words and the shape of that spectrogram looks different because we've changed pitch somewhere else, um, the words themselves um, aren't necessarily giving us enough of that meaning, right? Um, the reason why miscommunication can happen over text or email. Um, and so an example here, we've just taken a single question, are you driving to the bank later? Um, but we're trying to show where you put that emphasis can change the intent, right? Are you driving to the bank later? Is questioning who is going to the bank? Are you driving to the bank later? Driving has now been emphasized that you can hear that change in pitch. Um, maybe they're using a different mode of transportation. 
are you driving to the bank later? Is it a different location? Um, my favorite is this final one. Are you driving to the bank later? Which essentially is just questioning if anyone is doing anything anywhere. Um, very uh, sarcastic sort of tone. And so um, we can think of, you know, those prosody changes, um, do they just have a different meaning, even though it's the same string of text? And that ambiguity can confuse the model um, as well, which is why we haven't had awesome results in the past. Um, but in this model, um, we really wanted to reduce that ambiguity. And the straightest path forward was considering, okay, well, where are some consistent rules potentially um, in questions? How can we focus on delivering question types that do rise at the end, for example? Um, and we found that in US English in particular, it's very common for yes, no questions to do that. Um, so here's some examples, right? You could say, do you need assistance? And you hear that pitch go up versus how can I help you? Let me kind of drop back down. Both sound natural, um, but you don't always rise at the end. How can I help you? It's not, it's almost rude. <laughs> it's like, who are you that needs my help, right? Um, and so again, yes, no. Have you made your selection versus which selection did you make? Can you move on to the next step? When can we proceed? Okay. Um, so that's that's really the biggest area we were able to focus on is questions that do rise at the end. Can we have our voice actors train on some data that specifically requests that they rise at the end with this question? Can we start building in some consistency? Um, and yes, um, just to summarize, intonation is important, but it's ambiguous. Um, and so with those rules being tricky, it's hard for the model to learn and there are inconsistent um, and difficult to guess. So by expanding the knowledge base, we were able to give more language context in this model. Um, and we focused um, our training data again. Um, so we found that that did allow the model to produce more consistent intonations, which is awesome. So we went back and we trimmed and focused those data sets on questions that um, we asked the actors to read with that rise at the end. We tried to trim them down to yes, no questions, um, provided some surrounding word context. So do and, and, um, and have in those previous examples versus when and which, um, which are open-ended. Um, we, we feel like in this model, it's still obviously not perfect. It's very difficult to do, but um, we have seen an improvement and overcome those ambiguities around capacity and question delivery. So goal one, check. Next, uh, let's actually, before I, before I check it off, let's maybe prove that. Um, I put together some examples where we can hear how the model handled questions in the past and how our new model um, is knocking them out of the park. Do you need assistance? Do you need assistance? She's so engaging. You wanna you wanna answer her. Um, she sounds like she knows what she's saying instead of just reading flat text, which is great. Did you find our training content easy to follow? Did you find our training content easy to follow? Would you like a training mentor? She's so tired. Would you like a training mentor? So awake. Um, so yes, I thought these were awesome and you can definitely hear the rise at the end. It sounds like they're asking that question. Um, and even before the question component, I feel like I'm also noticing the sentence as a whole sounds more engaging. There's a bit more rise and fall that sounds natural. Um, so now we can say goal one, check. The next goal is um, how we handle these non-standard words. How, how do we actually verbalize those when we're speaking English? Um, numbers, symbols, URLs, et cetera. Marta, I'm curious again, um, you know, this goal came from some customer feedback. So do you have some insight there around what the experience has been like with numbers and symbols? Yeah, again, kind of a fun one. Um, I uh, previously have always given the advice to be as direct as possible when describing numbers uh, at, or you know abbreviations, URLs, anything like that. For example, you know dates. Uh, sometimes you need to like write out the number for. And we'll get into this. You know, twenty 
22 rather than having it being read like 2022. Uh, also, you know, if you want to have something say, you know, 10 million instead of just having that abbreviation, abbreviation of 10 M, you would need to write out the word million. Uh, and so, you know, just kind of those extra steps I know could be a bit frustrating. So that's why I'm super excited for all of our customers and, and me personally, as people that uh, somebody that's handling all of this question that this has been addressed in our latest model. So super excited for you to share more about what that looks like. Thanks. Yeah, me too. Um, that is exactly right. Those are some great use cases that I wanted to dive into, actually. Um, why are numbers so hard? So let's think back again. Um, just that spectrogram training view, we're always moving left to right when we read, and the spectrogram is as well. And so it's trying to figure out, you know, how am I visualizing how this set of text sounds? And specifically this set of text, when I write it with a symbol and numbers, um, it's seeing a dollar sign, but it's hearing and, you know, the text, sorry, it's seeing a dollar sign, but the visual that it's seeing is the shape of the sounds for the word 43. That doesn't align very well. What's going on? Um, so bringing in um, data like this can confuse the model. There's a more difficult pattern to try to learn. And we talk about almost 500,000 English words in existence. Well, there's infinite arrangements of symbols and numbers in existence as well. We're never going to train on um, enough data to let it just figure out that pattern. So how do we guide it? Um, that's really important. And just in English in general, I mean, we can see this in the visual, but we don't read dollar for three point one nine. Um, we see that pattern and we transcribe it in our heads to forty three dollars and nineteen cents. And then to your example there with million, we know that that's what that M stands for. Um, and so we can it, see this pattern and reinterpret it as seventeen point two million dollars. Um, similar example. What about the same exact set of numbers strung together, um, but in various contexts? How can we determine how we're supposed to say this? So um, these all look like the numerals 4020, but we would read the sentence, the year is 4020, and flight ship A14020G has finally landed 4,020 light years away, right? Um, so this is why it's, it can be a challenge and we understand we have some workarounds for you all in place. And like to Marta's point, separating a year into two two digit numbers is helpful, but how frustrating. We don't want you to have to continue doing that. Uh, we really wanted to uh, make the system a little bit smarter um, to help you all out. And so we um, started first by removing any of that ambiguous um, content from our training data. So we don't let the model see um, money signs written out like that or value amounts. Um, we, we try to stick to words only. And then we actually designed an approach that can detect those patterns in text, transcribe them into the words and the expected pronunciation given the surrounding context. Um, and the same thing will happen now when you put those symbols and numbers into the studio, it can do the same transcription and understand this is the intended pronunciation. Um, a big challenge still um, with that, uh, that uh, system design that we've added is to ensure that the transcriptions we offer are as accurate as possible that first time while still being flexible and allowing you all to share your preferences. So I don't want to assume that anytime you see a date, for example, you want it to say June 20th, 1988, you might want that to say June 20th. Um, and so as soon as we lock you into like this assumed verbalization, um, it, it can be a new frustrating workaround you have to work with. So towing that line um, today, if you type the date this way, it will say June 20, 1988. If you add the TH, you get June 20th, 1988. So now you have both options. Um, so we just try to be keep that flexibility for you all. Let's see some examples again. Let's see how the model tried um, to verbalize some symbols and numbers in the past, and then we'll listen to the latest model. Worldwide AI software revenue is forecast to total $62.5 billion in 2022, an increase of 21.3% from 2021, according to Gartner, Inc. Okay, so this one surprised me actually when I was uh, generating the older um, audio sample because 
she actually interpreted this as two sentences. So you probably heard how it dropped off between 21 and three. She didn't even try to say point three. It was just the end of the thought and then starting a new sentence at three. Um, and then again with the year 2022, like, yes, she made an attempt. Yes, she did it correctly, but it's not helpful. It's not natural. It's not how we speak. Um, let's see if the new system uh, is giving us what we want. Worldwide AI software revenue is forecast to total $62.5 billion in 2022, an increase of 21.3% from 2021, according to Gartner Incorporated. Cool. Uh, let's do one more. Today is August 18th, 2022. And now for question hash one, true or false? The threshold of visual acuity for a person with 2020 vision is about 0.3 cm. Again, I can't say he's completely incorrect, but it's not the most useful read and it's certainly not how most voice actors would interpret the same text. So here's the latest model. Today is August 18th, 2022. And now for question number one, true or false? The threshold of visual acuity for a person with 2020 vision is about 0 0.3 centimeters. Also, I am just like loving the armor. He is super fun to work with. I could hear his voice read these all day. All right. Finally, this big goal of improving pronunciation on the whole. I'm going to throw it back to you, Marta. Let's talk about what it's like for customers today working with tricky words, new words, et cetera, why we have a pronunciation library in the first place. What is that like? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so pronunciation, this is probably my favorite challenge that we run into uh, and from on the customer success team, you know, all day long, we get um, emails and chats from customers saying, you know, I'm unable to get uh, the AI to pronounce this word correctly, you know, insert long, complicated terminology. A lot of the times I have absolutely no idea how to pronounce this word or acronym as well. Uh, so it is kind of funny, you know, I always ask for, for patience uh, and understanding that I'm a human but on kind of that human note with pronunciation, you know, when you are the director, exactly like you would be directing a voice actor to pronounce a word correctly, you need to direct the voice avatar to pronounce it correctly as well. Um, one thing comes to mind uh, just last week, uh, I have a customer in the medical field. They reached out saying that they were having a really difficult time getting the AI to pronounce epiglottitis correctly. I had never even seen that word before. Uh, and so usually what I go, which I think is a privilege that I didn't know what that word was. Uh, I go to Google. I'm Googling how to pronounce it correctly. I try like a few different options, uh, you know, playing around with phonetic spelling, everything like that, I'm finally able to get the pronunciation of what I think is correct. And then I send it to them. Luckily, it was correct from their point of view. But again, I had never heard that word before. Uh, this is also funny in situations where sometimes there is preference on how to pronounce a word correctly. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is caramel versus caramel, you know, two different humans, Ryan and I could be pronouncing that word differently. So sometimes you do have to get a little creative. And again, you know, always directing the AI to pronounce a word phonetically and as correctly as you would like. It does take some patience, uh, but it does get me very excited and spoiler alert right now for our new respellings tool that I know you're getting into in a moment to kind of give more of that exact direct direction on how to get words to be pronounced exactly how you would like. So respellings has been a game changer for me. So excited to let you cover that and I'll stop being a spoiler alert on that. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> that is great. Um, and that is exactly right. Like that is the feedback. I, I can't always jump in and answer the same question, but I know you all are doing that all day long and every now and then it does reach it to the rest, to the rest of our Slack channel. And I'll try to jump in, um, we are well aware that there's always room to improve how well avatars, our avatars are uh, pronouncing everything. Let's talk first about why pronunciation is tricky. Um, and then we'll talk about why giving pronunciation cues is also tricky. 
um, and what we did to solve that. So um, when we think about word pronunciation, I'm going to be talking both about graphemes and phonemes. Um, graphemes is how you can, in short, is how words are written. Phonemes, how words are sound when they're spoken. Um, both are important to language, um, obviously. Um, but when you train a model, there's just some real nuance between the two um, that's really important. And so, for example, in English, there are only around 44 phonemic sounds between vowel and consonant phonemes. Um, an example here is the word speech. It's got six letters in it, but only four phonemes, and that will spell speech. Um, you know how to pronounce that based on those four symbols. But in English, Again, um, we have some weirdo rules for spelling, and we actually have around 229 graphical representations of these 44 sounds. Um, I put in a couple examples here, the, the sound A versus the sound I. Um, why do we have so many ways of writing A? I don't know. <laughs> uh, our English is a conglomeration of a bunch of other languages and, and historical rules. And um, I mean, even to your point, Marta, like you'll get a new word thrown at you and you're like, I've never even seen this word before. How am I supposed to, to say this? So um, you'll even see some overlap there. We see E-I-G-H. Um, you could say A, like in the number eight, or you could say I, like in the word height. Um, another example I love to use is this O-U-G-H graphene. Uh, depending on the word that O-U-G-H is thrown into, it can have six or more um, different pronunciations. I put these uh, six together because you can see rough has that uff sound. Um, O-U-G-H sounds like o oh, in though, oo in through, aw ah, in thought, off in cough, and ow in bow. Um, very, very challenging. If we think again about this model um, and how it's trying to derive, you know, uh, some sort of connection from how it's spelled to how that spectrogram should look, it just gets confusing. Um, apple is a simple word, but its pronunciation is not very intuitive in the end. Um, we don't pronounce both P characters, for example. Um, we don't pronounce the silent E at the end. And to go from that voiceless P sound to the L sound, we actually sneak in a little half vowel. Um, so we get two syllables in the word apple. Okay, but we don't write that vowel sound. We just know how to say P to L. Um, but if you think about it from the model's perspective, it's trying to learn each character and what that shape looks like in a spectrogram view. And now it's like, well, I, I seem to ignore the P this time and I ignore the E this time. And, and what are these rules? It, it can become more ambiguous and you need a lot of data to train on that. Um, so again, if the model only saw five of those O-U-G-H pronunciations, but a customer came and said, I want the avatar to say the word bow, it's going to pull on um, the information that it's learned and it's going to make a guess. And guess what? Our older model, in fact, did say boff instead of bow. Okay, so it made a good guess <laughs> um, relying on the data that it trained on, but um, it's just too ambiguous. English has a lot of, of tricky things like that. So um, again, at a high level, that graphemic approach means we're aligning audio with the graphical representation of English text. Um, we would need so much data um, to cover all of those various spellings for the same sounds. Um, and it's especially tricky to differentiate heteronyms, right? A word that's spelled the same, but spoken differently. So um, read versus read, all depends on context. Um, and it's not solely reliable <laughs> to look at how a word is spelled and know immediately how to say it. Um, so it, did, it does struggle to pronounce words, especially new words um, that it hadn't seen in training data. And similar to how we talked about why numbers and symbols are so difficult, it's moving left to right. Um, there's so many different rules for how we actually voice numerals or symbols um, in a graphical approach. There's just, there needs to be more context. So there's another approach um, that you can add. There's a phonemic concept. So we thought about the international phonetic alphabet. Um, we looked at how we can transcribe words into their phonetic representation um, because that's closer to what a spectrogram is, is visualizing, right? It's how the word sounds, not necessarily the characters that were used to spell, spell it in English. Um, IPA is the, the goal of IPA is to maximize that consistency and minimize ambiguity in spoken language. So you always know how to say a string of these symbols. Um, this is what a new uh, visual for, for our model would look like if we used phonetic um, transcriptions. We see Apple again. 
Um, but now there's just that single P character in the middle. You can see the sneaky vowel in the schwa, um, the L, and then there's no ambiguous extra characters that we don't pronounce. Anytime these symbols are strung together, you know it's going to say apple, which is great. So we've reduced some ambiguity there. We've given a bit more context. Um, now, if the system trained on those first five and the customer brought back uh, B-O-U-G-H, we could find that phonemic transcription, see the vowel sound is actually owl and, and, and say bow. Um, so that, that was a huge improvement for sure. Um, to summarize again, the phonemic approach means we are aligning audio with that phonemic representation of English text. We can learn all of that, that small set of sounds much more quickly from less data. Um, and it even can voice some basic numerals. So we heard that in some of the previous samples, it could say the dollar sign not the right context, but it could say dollar sixty-two point five. You know, it could say some numbers. Um, so that was a win for sure. Um, but when those phonemic transcriptions don't exist, then predictions can still fail or be confusing um, to guess. And so, in the latest model, we had to really reconsider um, those the limitations around graphemic and phonemic approaches, and how can we think about learning language and sounds um, differently. And, and what we considered is um, expanding the knowledge base. So while we're giving the model this string of text and these spectrogram images to learn from, we, we were able to give even more information. We could give language context, we reduced the ambiguity of the training data like we talked about, um, and we saw the model producing more consistent pronunciations, which is great. Um, so again, we went back, we focused, um, trimmed and focused those data sets gave word context, parts of speech tagging, um, additional things in the background we don't need to get into. But in the end, that goal of overcoming the limitations of sole, solely graphemic or solely phonemic approaches, um, that was the big revolutionary change in this latest model. So ideally, on the whole, you all will see that um, it's getting more words correctly on the first try. Um, that said, and Marta, you touched on this, um, there's always going to be room for preferences, caramel versus caramel, or unique um, internal words, um, industry specific terminology, things like that, invented words, or um, I know my name is spelled differently. People don't always know how to say it. There's, um, we could build the most sophisticated AI model that has all of the language context it needs to speak English, and there's still going to be a need um, for giving it more direction. So. Um, I was curious again if you had some more examples, maybe Marta, around um, how do we currently, like before this model came out, what was the workaround like for you all? Yeah, it was fun. And and again, I, I always recommend some patience uh, and always sitting back and looking at yourself as a director, just like you'd be directing a voice actor and need to do the same with the avatars. Um, kind of my three main suggestions for all kind of workarounds to making it sound as natural as possible is one, punctuation being your best friend. Again, uh, your scripts likely will end up not being grammatically correct when it comes to the punctuation, uh, but it really can make a huge impact when it comes to the different intonation and everything there, um, especially trying uh, around with the different kind of styles there. You know, with our narration um, for maybe one type of work that you're working on, um, or then maybe you want promo, which is a bit more of our kind of excited, enthusiastic, uh, you know, can add additional like spice to the script that you have going on, or our conversational if you wanted a bit more naturalness, or you have a bit more questions in your script uh, using that style versus narration or anything like that. So punctuation, kind of playing around with the different styles, um, as well as just the uh, phonetic spelling and, and pronunciation. Uh, it does take some kind of tweaking a little bit. Uh, and again, I always recommend Google. I use it myself all the time. Of like, how exactly is this word supposed to be pronounced? And even if you do know the pronunciation of this word and how it should sound, Google will kind of give you some inspiration of how to spell words out phonetically. Uh, you know, because sometimes should it be making a uh sound rather than an eh sound, anything like that? Google, to, uh, you know, type in, phonetic spelling of insert long complicated word and it'll inspire you a bit more to get things right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, and like we were touching on earlier, you know, we do field questions like this often and, and really trying to wrangle the model to understand this is the rule I want you to follow, this is the sound I want you to make, um, can just get tricky. Again, thinking about the, the previous approaches, um, when you have just that graphical, um, this is what we're limited to, right? We have our standard keyboard, we only have 26 letters in the alphabet, but when the system sees a word it, it's unfamiliar with, it's trying to think, okay, is this a case where I use that silent E rule? Should I skip that letter? Um, do I say two Ps? I don't know. Uh, if this should follow this rule set or this rule set, because we're just kind of in the wild west when we're limited to those the string of letters and those graphemes. So we know the phonemic approach um, helped uh, limit that ambiguity, right? But now we have to think about this set of symbols. Um, and we have had requests from customers saying, could we throw IPA into the studio? Um, can I give phonetic cues that way? Um, which does sound awesome. And, and we've heard the feedback and we would love to give uh, a phonetic approach we felt that the phonetic alphabet itself might be a little bit challenging for most users um, to, to wrangle. Um, this is a great quote from Wikipedia describing the system. There are 107 segmental letters, an indefinitely large number of suprasegmental letters, 44 diacritics, um, and four extra lexical rhizotic marks in the IPA. Um, that felt overkill to us. Um, not only is it going to give you the symbology for all sounds in all languages around the world and not just focus on those 44 English symbols, um, but just understanding the set of symbology, finding a keyboard where you can type these symbols or copy and paste um, pronunciation, it's a solution. Um, but we were really hoping to um, give you all something that's a little bit more approachable and intuitive um, and doesn't look like this. <laughs> So here is the Well Said Labs respelling catalog. Um, similar approach, we still wanted to think of this phonetically. We wanted to reduce um, those spelling rules into a very finite, consistent set of rules. But now you know if I want the A sound in ant, I can use a capital A. If I want the E sound in egg, it's going to be EH versus EE um, for E's, et cetera. Um, so referencing this guide and helping string together what those phonemic sounds should be. Um, was the first goal. And then offering um, syllable emphasis, because that's always been an issue. It's like, yes, you've said the letters C-O-N-T-E-N-T, -E but I want it to say content, not content. You know, um, how do I wield that a little bit more, um, more um, intuitively? And so we have allowed you to put um, lowercase uh, syllables in and uppercase syllables to differentiate where that emphasis should be. Um, so we're hoping that this has really simplified that approach for you. Um, here's another image of just what our system can look like. We've given it data now that understands um, Apple could be written as a respelling with that first syllable capitalized, that short A sound. Um, then we hear the single P. We don't need to write two Ps. We have the sneaky vowel and the UH sound um, followed by L. So very similar to the phonemic um, using the IPA approach, but we've reduced that symbology to the 26 um, letters in the alphabet um, that you are already familiar with. Um, so let's hear just a few examples. Um, I tried to include a couple of use cases that come to mind where respelling can be um, really helpful. Um, a goal, a, a side note goal we didn't touch on is initialisms. We were hoping that this model would understand if you're looking at a string of all caps letters, um, you probably want each letter spoken individually. Um, and yet sometimes intonation um, and emphasis within an initialism can be um, ambiguous. You don't necessarily want someone to say, please RSVP. That's unnatural. Um, and so enabling you to again give that guidance and here you can see it written out on the respelling side r and p get the emphasis please rsvp um, by eod etc um, i think initialisms are a great use case for when you want to specify where that emphasis should go let's hear an example please rsvp by eod so we can finalize the number of api access keys needed okay a bit overkill on all of the acronyms but i think you get the idea um, Marta touched on caramel versus caramel. There's always regional preferences and how people prefer to say things. Um, I use my buddy Diarmid again because I think he says this so well. You say tomato, I say tomato. 
um, now you can actually get your avatars to say that word in your preference. Um, I also mentioned my name. This is a friend's name, but people often mispronounce it saying, um, oh, your name is Malika. And she's always having to say it's Malika, please say Malika. Um, and so again, here's an example where we can wield um, with respelling that short A sound instead of a, a aw sound. My name is Malika and I'm happy to be assisting you today. One and done. Um, and finally, um, place names, those are always tricky. If you've been through the respelling guide already, you've seen um, Saskatchewan in there as a great example. Uh, not always an intuitive interpret uh, um, pronunciation. Um, and so our avatars are not speaking Spanish, but we have a lot of borrowed words and borrowed place names um, from other languages and we have Americanized ways of saying them. So respelling is another great way to step in um, for pronouncing place and other proper nouns. Let's go to La Jolla, California. And I like that example. We didn't do the previous, but um, without a respelling, they do say La Jolla instead. And so I like that example a lot. That's even how humans can work, right? When we don't know what we're seeing, um, we might just make a guess. Um, so we thought it would be fun if we did a pop quiz. Um, I'm going to pop over into the studio to see some of these play out, but Marta, let's, I'm going to hand it back to you for the pop quiz. Yes. Um, so we want to quiz Ryan on this. So everyone in the chat, uh, please throw in some difficult words or terminology that you're having difficulty with. And we'll have Ryan see if she can get it pronounced correctly with uh, our AI. We'll take a few different examples. So I already see one. We have allowable from Mike. So let's start with that. Um, Ryan, do you want to take allowable? I'm going to, we're not going to get too complicated uh, with the question. Let's just say this content is allowable. Let's hear what she says on her first pass. This content is allowable. Ooh. I understand, Mike, that's not what we wanted to say. Um, so let's go to the respelling guide. There's that Saskatchewan example. Um, most of it seemed right. It seems like that vowel sound, a lowable, should be allowable. Um, let's find where ow is gonna be one of our vowel combos right here, just like in cow. Um, so OW is, is still the symbology that we can use. Um, that first A is probably more of an uh sound, right? As in up. So we'll use UH um, and I'll see if I can do the rest from memory, but this is a, I wanted to show exactly how you can um, take advantage of the guide itself um, and, and, and understand to hear this sound as in this word type, this symbol. Um, and here's an example. So let's see if we can change this into a respelling. First, let's just take an attempt at what the sounds should be. We know it's a, uh, the next syllable is allow. Back to a, allow a bull. Um, B sound. And now I want to think well, which part of that um, word is emphasized? Is it allowable? Is it allowable? Is it allowable? I think that third one, I'm going to put the emphasis on wow. And let's see how she handles this. This content is allowable. Cool. No yeah. more Wild West guessing. I gave her directions that were very clear um, and she knew exactly how to string those syllables together. So great example. That was great, yeah. Um, and for the sake of time, maybe let's just do one more example. And it is kind of funny because I'm kind of proving my own point from earlier. Some of the suggestions here, I do not know how to pronounce. So I'm not gonna make you try to figure out the pronunciation on the fly here, but I did see the word respirator come up. Um, would you, do you want to try that one out? One more time. We'll just hear how she tries it. He should use a respirator. That actually sounds pretty good to me, um, which goes back to, I'm sure this was uh, a problematic in our previous model, ideally. Um, the, the new model has handled this all on its own, which is awesome. Maybe I see zeitgeist, should we try that? Yeah, that was a word I didn't know how to pronounce, so good for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's try that. 
and that's a great example because again we do have these borrowed words um if this is german we say it differently a word in the zekist zekist not really what we want so we're going to try one more time z-a-y-g-a-y-s-t zeitgeist oh i missed the t um these kind of sound like equally um emphasized in my ears so we're going to try both um I could be wrong. If you have a preference, let me know if one of them should be emphasized. A word in the zeitgeist. Oh, oh, I, I picked the wrong. Uh, how embarrassing. I picked the wrong vowel sound. Let's try a Y. A word in the zeitgeist. Cool. So I think she did great. Good from, oh, sorry. I was going to say that sounded great from somebody that didn't really know how to pronounce that word in the first place. <laughs> good work. Awesome. Um, fun pop quiz. Thank you guys. Um, so just in summary, why is this latest model so revolutionary? Um, we reconsidered language sounds, ambiguities, um, and tooling, this, this respelling tool specifically, um, in order to deliver our most intuitive and helpful text to speech to date. We hope you all find that to be the case. Um, we hope that you find more accurate pronunciation on the first try. This new respelling system gives you that ability to give pronunciation cues when you need it. We hope that questions are delivered better and more naturally as well. You again, might have even more success if you stick to those yes, no question types, um, but please experiment with all of them. We're hoping questions on the whole have improved. Um, and finally, less manipulation of those special characters for years and money and, and other things. Um, so, what is coming? Um, we are happy to announce some more voices are in the works. They'll be coming um, early next month. This will include our first ever non-binary voice. We're very excited about first of more to come, um, as well as two new English accents. Um, and finally, new styles coming for Bella and Marcus, which is great. And Marta did touch on this. This The reason for all of um, these improvements and this presentation as a whole comes directly from feedback from you all. So we really do appreciate. Um, please continue to provide it. It will guide our roadmap and um, give us that understanding of uh, where is the friction still in place and how can we smooth things out for you all. Time for some questions. Yeah, Ryan, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I feel like I always learn so much just listening to you. So it's always a pleasure. Okay. Um, we did get some questions coming in. We have about seven minutes left. Uh, so we'll get through as many as possible. Um, if you have more questions, please feel free to continue throwing them into the Q&A chat. Um, one thing to start out with, uh, we did get questions regarding words that uh, are spelled the same but pronounced differently. For example, record versus record. You know, I know you kind of touched on this earlier, like content versus content. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about how our AI approaches those words and uh, any solutions that we have? Yes. So um, again, always always room for improvement, but ideally because we've been able to give the model um, in this iteration more language context, um, we're noticing that it is able to, based on words around it, based on the sentence as a whole, understand that this should be record. And in this instance, it should be record, much the same way we make that differentiation ourselves. Um, live and live has also been problematic and we're seeing an improvement there. So because we've been able to give more than just sounds, um, We've been able to give language context to the model. It's it's making better choices around those ambiguities. That said, um, it will still fall short occasionally, especially if there's not enough context. So that's where the respelling system can really come in handy to be very specific around wanting live versus live, record versus record. Yep, absolutely. And to kind of add on to that too, we do have our pronunciation library that allows you to save the pronunciation of specific words. That is a bit challenging when it comes to those words that are spelled the same but pronounced differently. So I do just recommend kind of, you know, tweaking it for each kind of different context that you run into and not necessarily saving that to your pronunciation library unless you're always going to have it pronounced like live and not live. Um, great question there. Uh, another question that came in, this was an interesting one. Um, I think I have my answer, but I'm curious your answer first, Ryan. Uh, so repeating a phrase to put emphasis on something that should be emphasized is important to draw attention to the listener. Um, do we have a solution for that? So, you know, wanting the second sentence to be emphasized 
that's the same. Am I repeating? Am I saying that correctly? Do you understand the question? And let me see if I understand. It's the same text, but yes. if you're reading it again, it's kind of understood that you should put additional emphasis there. Yes. Um, the model itself is not going to make that same jump in logic necessarily. Um, I think that's a case where um, punctuation, like Marta has indicated with quotation marks and other things might help. Um, that said, we are, that's great feedback. I think um, we are always looking for ways to give the model guidance that a human would interpret similarly. Um, that's not something I can guarantee in this current model, but great feedback to try um, to incorporate next time. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I was gonna say. For the exact same sentence, uh, if you want, the, you know, the second time that the sentence is read to be read differently, emphasized a bit more, going in and adding that different punctuation, uh, in particular specific uh, quotation marks around a word or phrase will definitely, definitely help with the emphasis there. Um, kind of a fun question real quick. Uh, I did hear of what's everyone's favorite voice avatar. Uh, so for all of our listeners, you know, I see some people throwing in their favorite avatar. We have an inside joke here at Wall said that I have a crush on our avatar, Tobin. Um, it's completely true. I love Tobin. There's just something about him. <laughs> but Ryan, I'm curious who's your favorite. I have to say after this presentation, it might be Diarmid. He's doing awesome. And he sounds so lovely to listen to. <laughs> yes. And he is a Scottish, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's it's lovely. Yeah, it is, you know, kind of wants you to like put you to sleep or, or tell you a story or something like that. Awesome. Um, I have heard uh, other questions about uh, wanting to add in different accents still in English, such as a Spanish speaker speaking uh, in English. Uh, that is kind of something that we are playing around with. Uh, I don't wanna make any guarantees or timelines or anything like that, but diversifying our voice portfolio and our voice library is something that is incredibly important to us just as a value here at WellSaid. Uh, so I will say more to come on that, but I will keep it vague. Uh, anything that you wanted to add to that, Ryan? No, you're right. Um, we do have more accents coming and because we're able to hire now too, we're expanding the team that is responsible for um, finding our voice actors and how to diversify um, that the marketplace of voices that we offer. So definitely more to come because of that. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it looks like we have another question that came in here regarding adding pauses, but particularly to the end of a sentence. Uh, sometimes this can be difficult. We don't have the exact direction or controls in well said to, you know, add a five second pause, for example, at the end of a sentence. Uh, however, from the customer success perspective, a couple workarounds, if you do want to add in an additional pause at the end of a sentence or a clip or anything like that um, before the next sentence, you can always create two separate clips and then use our combine functionality. Oh, yep. Perfect, right there, select combine. Uh, and then it gives you the option to add in an additional pause between those clips. So if you want that longer 1.2 second pause, you can do so by adding it there. And then it'll kind of break those two clips into two se separate sections. Uh, again, if you just need kind of a smaller pause, adding in different punctuations such as ellipses, a couple extra commas, spaces, anything like that can help, uh, but using that combined functionality of two separate clips can help as well. Great, um, another question that came in and we'll just keep this as the last one. Uh, how effective is your model over long examples of text? <laughs> uh, I'm curious. Uh, the definition of long, um, but we are very proud to say that we um, we have definitely overcome the very, very early challenges in the early days of being restricted to short text. Um, we can do very long. We voiced um, as an experiment. Uh, now I'm forgetting which book, but an audio book um, uh, and, and it, it handled it just fine. We used to hear some degradation over time and, and we've really uh, removed that barrier. So I would say it's very effective over long examples of text. <laughs> 
<laughs> Very effective. We'll leave it at that as kind of our, our ending note here. Uh, so we are up on time. Again, thank you so much, Ryan, uh, for walking us through this today. Thank you, everyone who was able to join. Uh, if you have any additional questions uh, that we weren't able to answer today or you're interested in WellSED as a whole, please visit us at our website, wellsedlabs.com, uh, to learn more. Um, we're always happy to help uh, answer any questions or get you on board with uh, creating voiceover content. So we'll leave it at that. Thanks again, Ryan, and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Take care.